first thing is, if you're new to us, we would like you to um, join us, join, come to our, our website. We would um, ask you to please um, sign up where it says, at least join our, ma our mailing list, but to consider becoming a member of the organization. Uh, individual membership is only $40 a year, and um, if you're a senior citizen or a student, it's $20 a year. And that, but if you join our mailing list, then we can get in touch with you and let you know about other programs that we're having. Um, you can see under um, latest news, you can catch the YouTube video of our last presentation, which was Mike Skindle um, explaining our bill, House Bill 292. We have one about expanding the social safety net with Melinda um, St. Louis and Alex, uh, Lars, Alex Lawson from, uh, Melinda's from Public Citizen and Alex is from uh, Social Security um, Works. And we have the YouTube video of Wendell Potter. We also have our economic impact study and that was done that would give the, all of the financial information that we would need for um, a single payer bill here in Ohio. Also, um, on the upcoming events, you'll see the things that are taking place and when they're taking place. And, um, and if there's anything that you would like to join into, there's contact information if you just click on it and you can come um, to any of those part, um, events. Um, the other thing too is we would also invite you to get active in SPAN Ohio by being a member of our state council. And if you are interested in doing that, you can contact me um, at, I'm Debbie Silverstein, you contact me at SPAN at SPANOhio.org and just let me know and we can get you seated on the state council. We also have several committees that you can get involved in if you're a member of the state council and we're working you know to to keep moving this forward and um, and make the the group function the best that we can so we have committees on finance and fundraising membership conference and programming um, communications and our lobby committee and I'm sure that we'll have more as time goes by um, now as I said our, our guest is Ivanka Hall from the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. And she's been doing some marvelous work during this pandemic. And um, Ivanka, how many meals did you serve under your Babies and Brunch program? Oh, you're still, you're muted. Ivanka, you're muted. You wanna unmute yourself? There you go, okay. Right now it's um, 25,000 over these last 16 weeks. Um, and as of um, this Sunday, um, we would have served 30,000 um, meals, breakfast, lunch, and snacks over these last 16 weeks. And these are um, families of children that would normally get meals at school, correct? These are families of children who are disabled, who normally should get meals at school but because the school system didn't put in a place into place um and a direct action in order to deliver the meals we're delivering the meals so um not only are we delivering the children that are um in the school um meals but also their siblings so they may have younger siblings also at the house so they're all getting meals so we our families range from one child to seven children Wow, I mean that is really fantastic and 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 very impressive and great work. And you've done a lot of work on education about COVID and what people need to do to protect themselves. And you do an awful lot of work on education about um, disparities in healthcare and um, what needs to change in healthcare, and also the social determinants of health that affect um, the health of people of color and communities of color. Um, because it's not all medical care. A lot of it, there's a lot of things that go into the health of an individual. And the unfortunate part of it is with the system that we have, um, communities of color are often impacted at a much higher degree than that. Definitely. So, um, you know, so the work that you're doing is just marvelous. Ivanka's um, group will also be having a conference um, later in the summer. Are you going to get started on that? 
So we'll, we'll, we have um, another workshop called Back to School or Not, um, which comes up at the end of July, so on July 31st. And then right after that, we'll kick off our conference series. Um, and so we'll be focusing on environment, um, um, racism, um, jail bail and um, reform, infant mortality, um, women's wellness, chronic disease, and then heart disease and disparities. So we have a, we normally have a big conference that lasts for two days. And so it was like, how do we use this format to break out that conference? And so now we're having these conference series. Yes. Well, and I went to, to one of Ivanka's conferences and I'll tell you what, it is really eye opening and I learned so much at it. So I would, um, encourage all of you people that are on tonight's call to attend those conference series and you can get the information about that from your web page for the um the northeast ohio black health coalition and if you would be so kind to put the, the um address of, for your web page in the chat so that people can bookmark that and look okay. for that information that would be great so tonight ivanka is going to talk about um Racism in healthcare. Do Black Lives Matter in healthcare? And to what extent? And how do we change things so that they, so that everybody gets the quality healthcare that they deserve? You know, we we tend to think that some of the disparities in healthcare are genetic, but they're not. And there are studies that have proven that it's not. There was one that came out of the VA that showed that when African Americans get the same high quality care and treatment as Caucasian patients, that their outcomes are as good or better. So we can't rely on it and just say it's genetics. It's not. It's, you know, it, there are other issues. So I'm going to let um, Ivanka go ahead and get started. And um, we will have question and answers when she's finished. Okay. So thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Span Ohio, for inviting me here to talk. Um, I am Ivanka Hall, the original. I always have to tell people that, um, that there is another Ivanka, but I am, I am the Ivanka. Um, and that the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition has been around since 2011. We actually became a 501c3 in 2015 um, with our work around policing, around the policing issue in Cleveland. Um, for those who know me, um, you will know that um, I organized a community around the issue, around the systemic issues that were going on in the Cleveland Police Department. And hundreds of people came out to a, uh, a local conversation on the Department of Justice. Um, out of that conversation, we created a community corrective action plan. And that corrective action plan was used to craft a consent decree for the city of Cleveland. Um, and right after that, I walked into my office and I was fired um, for speaking out and allowing the community to have a voice. And so what I want you to know is that um, I speak what I need to speak for the community because it is so important for the community to have um, an outlet to, for them to, to be able to have a voice that not only understands the ins and outs of what's going on in the community, but what's going on outside, what's going on in corporate America that may impact us, what's going on around policing, what's going on around education, what's going on around, around our employment issues. And so the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition is the first coalition in the state of Ohio to focus exclusively on disparities in the African-American community. Those disparities are disparities in education, employment, housing, and health. And we work to um, educate, advocate, and empower the community. So we do that every day. Um, but if I was naming this um, discussion tonight, I think I would name it Racism in America. COVID has exposed what, uh, what Black America has been talking about for years. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that's important for us to understand about race and racism is that it's not that it never existed before COVID, is that the things that Black America has been talking about for years and years around inequities um, impacting us, whether we're talking about housing, whether we're talking about our educational attainment for our young people, um, and what's going on with our schools. Um, as we know, but right now we have school systems that are um, inadequately prepared to take our children back. Um, kids don't have tablets and they also don't have the, the learning materials that they need in order for them to continue their 
classroom education outside of the classroom. Um, and that would mean um, also including um, Wi-Fi access. And so we talk about, you know, what goes on in communities and in communities of color. But for me, it's um, very much important for us to know um, what's going on within our school systems, what's going on around jobs. We have numbers of African-American workers who are working in essential jobs. They're working um, some of these frontline staff, a lot of nurses, a lot are working at your drug stores, at your grocery stores. A lot of them are very much exposed on a day in and day out basis. And so when we're talking about what's going on with them and what's going on with them health-wise, um, I know that someone had a, a question about COVID um, and they wanted to know, like, what, what are African-Americans doing to, 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 to protect themselves from COVID? And so one of the things that we have to say is that our work situations, our livelihoods are putting us at a higher risk for COVID. Um, and not so much like a lot, you know, we have um, people who are, oh, well, how come people don't wear masks? We have the not wearing masks in a number of communities. But for us, it's, we are essential workers. So we may be wearing masks at work, but we're actually being exposed all the time. And in some cases, from people coming into our establishments and not wearing masks at all. So I have a presentation, so I'm gonna do a screen share and um, bear with me. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna go through my presentation. So I'm hoping that everybody can see everything. Um, so one of the things that we have to talk about when we talk about African-Americans in America is we have to talk about our experience in the United States. I think that all too often we talk about um, the African-American experience like, oh, well, look, you've, you've been free since 1865. So, wow, how come you haven't pulled your book self up? by your bootstraps since 1865. And so what we don't talk about is the time prior to 1865 and what has happened since 1865. So African-Americans um, arrived in the United States and even though this grid says um, 1619 and we, we talk about the 1619 project all the time, but the first African-Americans in the United States actually came into the States in the 1500s. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that that African-Americans first came here to the States in the 1500s. Um, and so we count that time between the 1500s and um, 1865, those times, um, so if we go from the 1500s to 1954, that time accounts for about 87, 90% of our experience here in the United States. And so the time since then only marks about um, 10 to 13% of our experience here. And so, when we tell people to get over their, the historical issues that have disproportionately impacted their community, particularly when we tell black people to get over it, we're talking about something that's 90% of who they are, of what their experience has been here in the United States and how racism has played a role in that experience. What our issue is, is that African-Americans are plagued with persistent race-based disparities that have existed for centuries and this has impacted their health compared to their white counterparts and the population as a whole. Now, I'm actually going to put it in the chat. I was going to show you a video, but for the sake of time, I'm not. But there's a video called Race Baiting 101. Um, there is a young man named Matthew Cook, um, last name Cook, um, C-O-O-K-E, and I'll put it in the chat, who actually produced this video. And when he produced this video, the video actually talks about race and racism, and it talks about um, the structural racism that has existed um, for centuries here in the United States and what was done to African Americans. Um, and not only African Americans, but they also talk about poor whites. Um, and so that race baiting 101 is usually how I open up my conferences. I open up my conferences with Matthew Cook because Matthew Cook is a blue eyed white guy who actually um, understands the issues that are disproportionately impacting the community. And for a lot, a lot of members in the community, it's important for me to start off talking about a black issue with a white face. Why? Um, because Matthew Cook adds credibility to the things that I discuss. Um, and that's a shame that we have to say that, but because of race and racism, um, a lot of times what happens is when black people talk about 
um, the structural racism in our systems, it's kind of ignored. But when white people talk about the issues around structural racism and how it impacts and disproportionately impacts communities of color, all of a sudden people's spidey senses start to go off and they start to go, oh, well, maybe they have something there. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things that we've seen in COVID is that black people had been, you know, had been talking about the issues that were going on. But all of a sudden, George Foreman, um, George Floyd, um, the death of George Floyd allowed all of us to take the time and actually listen. Um, and that listening caused a whole ripple effect um, that allowed other people to see the disparities that African Americans have been talking about in our policing system for a long time. Remember that our policing systems here in the United States were built on racism. They were originally slave patrols. Um, and so we have to understand the past of our police and why our police were established here um, in order for, and they were you know, created to um, control the African American community. Um, and so we have to examine systems. And so in those systems, we have to look at the structural racism that impacts all of these systems. And I know I may not have all of the systems up here, just, but just think about any other system that you can imagine, whether it's our food system, our educational system, environment, housing, our policies, um, transportation, economics, health, employment, all of those things are systems that um, are structurally deficit when it comes to African Americans and caring for African Americans. Why? Um, racism has operated at an institutional, intellectual, policy, and personal levels. So we have to understand that racism operates at all of these levels. So in order for us to address the issues that are disproportionately impacting African Americans, um, we have to be ready to dig into um, all of those systems, the institutional systems, intellectual, policies, and personal. Talking to people about how they personally feel about um, different communities. Um, racism is deeply ingrained in the fabric of the US medical social culture. You know, how many people even realize that um, the American Medical Association actually until the, 19, the late 1970s we're still using monkeys in their books as a display of African Americans. You know, so when you looked in the book and you looked for African Americans, the face that you saw was a monkey. Um, and so that is important for us to understand because we have to, to remember that we have people who are being educated in these very systems um, that are looking at us as anything less than human. Um, disparities in African Americans have widened and become institutionalized. Um, and so we look at um, the things that went on. You know, we had um, African Americans who years ago, I know in my family, we talked about it, that we knew um, that, um, that slaves had built, you know, the areas around D.C. and that Central Park was originally an area that encompassed a lot of African Americans. There was a village that African Americans lived in Central Park. And because they looked at Central Park as prime real estate, all of a sudden, African Americans that li lived in Central Park were displaced in order for them to make way for Central Park. Um, and so we have to talk about the biases and the policies that took place in order dis to displace African Americans from their homes. Um, and so then for me, I'm a storyteller. So we have to talk about what challenges have you faced as a patient um, for African Americans. Um, and so for me, as a patient um, and a person who's worked in a healthcare facility, um, even working at a healthcare facility did not um, keep me away from the biases that existed in medicine. I remember going to the office and going to see the doctor at an office that I worked at every day. I walked in the doctor's office. I sat down like all patients to see the doctor. I went in because I was having difficulty breathing. Um, I said, look, I cannot sleep. Every time I go to lay my head down, you know, I have this severe headache, I start coughing. Um, I went in, they said, okay, well, we're gonna give you a couple days. We're gonna give you a couple days off, you know, go relax, you know, come back. Um, a couple days later, was worse than I was the first day. Um, went back, saw another doctor, same. I worked there, I worked with them. 
um, went back, got worse. Um, and then that weekend, I went into work because I had no more sick days left. And when I went into work, I walked into the office of a doctor who was not there to work. He was there actually processing paperwork. And I said, um, I can't breathe. I am, I am, I'm trying to work, but I am not feeling well. And so he asked me what was going on. I described to him all of my symptoms the same way I had to the other doctors prior to. One was an African-American female and the other one was a white male. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to send you home. I'm giving you some antibiotics. I'm sending you over for blood work and I'm sending you for an x-ray. The x-ray isn't going to show up positive, but the blood work will. You have pneumonia. And so I'm sending you home because you have pneumonia. You have microplasma pneumonia. And I was floored. Um, like pneumonia. Um, and yeah, I did. I had pneumonia. And if I had continued to work, if I had continued to just lay down, I would have died at home. And so we have to, to be willing and able and ready to listen to what patients are saying. Um, and so that is one of the challenges that I face as a parent, as a patient. The other challenge is a challenge that's another personal challenge with my grandmother. My grandmother's 89 years old, but I remember in the 70s when my grandmother was in her 40s, in her early 50s, I think, um, she went to the doctor because she had to have surgery. And so she had surgery. She went in for the surgery. It was supposed to be a minor procedure and she would be home. She came home and she was in pain. And every other week, she was, every other day, I think she was calling the doctor and every other week she was at the doctor's office complaining about this pain. I'm in so much pain. I'm in so much pain. I'm in so much pain. And after a year, she went to, a, to her doctor and her doctor was not there. Another doctor had to see her. And the doctor ordered an x-ray. And when they x-rayed my grandmother, they found out that a medical instrument had been left in her from the surgery from a year before. Um, the medical instrument that she had been complaining about for a whole year. Um, and now my grandmother is 89. She is in a wheelchair um, with complications from that surgery that happened so long ago. And um, it costs her her ability to walk. And so we have to understand that as an African-American, we face lots of biases, whether it's biases about our disbelief, their disbelief about our pain, um, or whether it's biases just within the systems itself and how patients are processed. Um, you know, so African-Americans go through a lot. And if I sat down and said, you know, hey, let me just tell you all the stories about my family, it would take up days and days and books um, of writing. And so the other thing that we have to talk about when we talk about this historical basis and the, the issues that go along with African-Americans is we always talk about the Tuskegee experiment. I, you know, every time someone wants to talk about things that, were egregious that happened to African Americans. The first thing they say is the Tuskegee experiment. Even though they want to call it a study, it was an experiment. Um, but I have to talk about slave medicine and understand that slaves, people who were denied rights and who were kidnapped from their native land and brought here, um, were actually used as experimentation to create the things that we look at today as modern medicine. Um, Dr. Marion Sims, who has been noted as the father of gynecology, um, actually used slave women to create gynecological instruments and procedures and practices. Um, we actually had brain surgeries that were done on slaves and done to people while they were awakened. We had people who had limbs removed. Um, we had different types of things that happened, um, cruelties that happened in medicine from people who were, by people, um, who were practicing medicine um, on people who had no rights here in the United States. We also have to talk about Henrietta Lacks, um, the Hella cells, um, and the fact that her Hella cells, her cell has been used to uh, make millions, make billions and billions of dollars in medical science, but her family has received no money. Um, and actually, they should have actually been told what was going on with their mom in case any of them also had any of the traits um, for the particular cancer that killed her. 
um, but they weren't. And it, they weren't because they were poor and because they were African-American. So those are some of the things around the historical basis. The other thing is we have to talk about slave, um, about African-American health status. Um, because, you know, the other thing is like, hey, well, you know, no matter what kind of things we do for African-Americans, they still don't get better. And so we know that there are two periods that African-American health status actually improved in the United States. Okay, and so that one period was between 1865 and 1872, which was that post-Civil War Reconstruction era. Um, the change of health status was actually linked to the Freedmen's Bureau um, legislation. It established black medical schools, hospitals, and clinics throughout the South. Um, basically, what the Freedmen's Bureau did was it, it saved African Americans from extinction. Um, now, mind you, that was the mindset. Um, people thought um, in the North and the South that in order for them to get rid of this slave problem, in order for them to get rid of this African American problem, was when we free them, they will have no, no means, no other way to survive, um, and they'll just die. Um, and they expected us to walk off the plantation into extinction. So they never expected to be in 2020 um, facing the issues that go on with the African American community. So the Freedmen's Bureau, Congress established the medical division of the Freedmen's Bureau, the nation's first federal health care system, to address the health crisis but the um, officials deployed just 120 or so doctors across the war-torn South. Um, then they ignored those doctors' pleas for personnel and equipment. So even though they ignored the pleas um, for personnel and equipment, African-American health status um, improved. Um, they erected more than 40 um, hospitals, but prematurely shuttered most of them. Um, and so... This, this is one of the quotes that came from an Ohio congressman <coughs> during that time. He says that no charitable black scheme can wash out the color of the Negro, change his inferior nature, or save him from his inevitable fate. And it sounds so much like what was said um, by an Ohio congressman, um, an Ohio um, Senator a few weeks ago when he said around COVID um, that colored people were dying because they did not wash their hands. Um, and so we have to understand that this was in the 1800s and the remarks that I just stated were from 2020. So when we talk about bias and we talk about bias in medicine, um, the bias is they still there. Um, and so these other two periods that African health of status, status improved. Um, so we talked about the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and then the other time would be 1965. So between 1965 and 1975 um, was the Civil Rights Movement. So the 1965 Civil Rights Act, it outlawed racial discrimination in government funded health programs. So it outlawed racial discrimination in these government funded um, health programs. It provided us with Medicaid and Medicare, um, the hospital desegregation, um, it integrated staff and patients um, in hospitals and community and neighborhood centers were established. So those centers were very important to the community because it allowed the community to have something close by in order for them to seek out services to. And so what we've seen in 2020, well, at least in the last 20 years, is that we've slowly started to close those neighborhoods health centers that African Americans were relying on for care. And now we're back to a lot of people going to emergency rooms for care. Um, from 1975, um, post-civil rights movement, our gains were halted. Um, since 1980, there has been a big decline in the health status of African Americans. And this can be directly attributed to busing, um, the war on drugs, black flight, and white flight for our urban um, communities, the closure of mental health facilities. Um, we had mental health facilities that were um, within a community, and now we have no mental health facilities. And then also um, the closing, the opening of prison. So that prison industrial complex, um, you know, is some of the things that we also saw that was going on around um, the African-American community.
the last part of the historical basis is the Kerner Commission report um, on civil disorders. It was released in February 29th of 1968. I talk about the Kerner Commission report all the time because I believe that the Kerner Commission report was the best report um, that was ever created to talk about the social determinants of life in the African-American community. And nobody, even though the report sold millions and millions of copies, nobody decided to follow through with any of the recommendations in the report. Isn't it strange? You know, they give you, you do this report, you know, we come up with all these recommendations. They're great recommendations and people are like, I'm not doing this garbage and they toss it away. So Dr. King, who was still alive when the Kerner Commission report was issued, pronounced the report a physician's warning of approaching death with, with a prescription for life. With a prescription for life. Um, so he looked at this report and said, look, the report is telling you that, look, death is imminent. If we continue with what's been going on, but if we follow, follow these mandates, if we follow these um, recommendations and actually make them mandates and make them policies, we will actually have a prescription for life. Um, and sadly, two months later, he was gone. But I think that if he had been here, we would have had Medicaid, Medicare for all earlier. Um, we would have haven't just been talking about it. I think it would have happened um, because I think he would have really pushed this report and um, made legislators take note of what was going on in the report. The other thing that the report talked about was poor health. And he says that the report says it results in a higher mortality rate, a higher incident of disease, um, lower availability and utilization of medical service. But it also talked about infant mortality rates being 58% higher than whites. And we're talking about infant mortality rates now, like, oh, this whole infant mortality thing just happened. But we know that African-American infant mortality and African-American maternal mortality has been high since we got here. Um, and so that is important for us to know. Um, racism in medicine was the last report um, that was actually one of the authors of that report um, was Louis Stokes, our, um, our late congressman, who did so much around health and wellness within the African-American community. So racism in medicine um, and health parity for African-Americans, the slave health deficit was produced by the National Medical Association in 2002. So it talked about the same thing that I talk, talked about earlier, that racism in medicine has operated at institutional, intellectual, policy and personnel levels is deeply ingrained in the fabric of the U.S. But to eliminate persistent race-based disparities, the U.S. must implement dramatic changes in policies that hide the structure, functioning, and financing of the healthcare system and must direct efforts to produce a system and a workforce that is culturally competent in dealing with African Americans. Remember that word, cultural competence because we're gonna talk about that right now. Um, so we have lots of systems that always talk about cultural competency. You know, oh, you know, I had to do a class. Oh, but cultural competency just refers to how systems are able to interact within systems. Do systems do, do government agencies, nonprofit organizations, human resources, do they do what they're supposed to do in their context, right? So. What I need our systems to be is I need our systems to be culturally proficient, okay? And cultural proficiency is understanding how people work. What works well for people where they are? Because people on one side of town may have different needs from people from another side of town. Um, so we need to understand um, how people work. You know, if you have a mom who has three children who's catching the bus to get to a doctor's appointment and she's there and she's 15 minutes late and you say to her, well, you're 15 minutes late. We can't see you. We're going to schedule you again for a month. And you don't know the backstory. You don't know what it took for her in order for her to get her three children onto buses. It may have taken them two, three or four buses 
to get to that appointment. Um, she may have had to take off from work. She may have had to take some of the children out of school. And now she's here in front of you with a need to see the doctor. And you're saying, well, you can't see the doctor today. So we need our systems to be culturally proficient. And so we need you to understand that cultural competency is important. It's important for your systems to work efficiently, but it's also important for your systems to work where they can help people the most. I think the long asked question um, around racism and around health for African Americans has been, where does health begin? Um, and so for me, it begins at home. You know, it begins long before people go into a health establishment. Um, it begins with all the things that disproportionately impacts um, communities, um, pervasive discrimination, um, health, education, housing, employment, Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. Um, the lack of a high school diploma leads to limited employment prospects, low wages and poverty. So what happens to that person's health status? Segregation, lack of affordable housing, environmental hazards, and homelessness are all associated with adverse health outcomes. Um, employment, higher unemployment rates and work, um, you know, African Americans may have higher unemployment rates and work in the worst jobs, um, which feature lower pay and fewer benefits um, and more work in essential jobs, like I stated earlier. Um, and so healthcare begins at home. How do we make sure um, that people are getting what they need? Now, what will work? For me, one of the things that I noticed is the triage process for hospitals. Um, is one of the things that needed to totally be changed. Um, triage, I've never been to a hospital that asked the person about their race. I've never been to a hospital that asked the person about their employment or if they work at a factory um, or if they think that they've been exposed because of work or ask them questions about housing. Do you have bugs? Have you used sprays? Did you try to bomb your house? Do you have any peeling paint or old windows? Have you recently completed any renovations? Do you live near any factories? Have there been any environmental um, um, hazards in your neighborhood? Have you ever ran out of food? Are your gas, lights, and water currently working? Do you have a working refrigerator and stove? Are you homeless? Have you slept at a friend's house more than twice this month? Um, do you drive or take the bus? If you take the bus, if they take the bus, then being able to refer them to social services um, so that transportation can be arranged. You know, maybe hospitals provide services. Maybe their, their healthcare system provides services and they just don't know. Um, you want to collect, select culturally appropriate screenings and assessment tools where necessary. So you want to say, you know what? We need to make sure that these screenings are um, culturally appropriate for the communities that we're seeking to serve and they're getting to the heart of the matter. Now, when I go back and I talk about whether you have lights or gas, um, I remember working in a healthcare facility and I worked in social services and they sent us to a patient's home because the patient's, her hypertension, her blood pressure was through the roof and they couldn't get her to be compliant with her doctor's appointments. So old social workers used to come out to your house. So we went out to her home to see how she was doing. So myself and the, the lead social worker, when we got to her house, one of the things we noticed is that it was cold. And so, do you have any gas? Is your gas on, ma'am? Um, no, you know, I'm going to, I'm trying to arrange, you know, with the bill now. Okay, well, you know, we can, we can help with that. Um, and that's the fact that because she did not have gas, she was cooking everything on the stovetop. And so, because she was cooking everything on a stovetop, um, she was eating a lot of processed food. So a lot of her, everything that she was eating was coming out of a can um, because, you know, she had to have something that she could warm up on the stove. I mean, that she could warm up on a hot plate. Um, and so we have to understand what was going on at her house. She had two sons that were there. Both her sons um, had been caught up in um, this whole war on drugs and both of them had criminal records and weren't able to gain employment. Um, and at the time, we had no systems that people could go to and say, you know, hey, we have some programs that can actually train you for readiness and get you back into the job market. We actually still don't have enough. Um, and, you know, in our, in our continuation of what will work, we have to determine readiness and motivation for behavioral change as necessary. 
Um, so we have to talk to people and find out if they're mentally um, ready um, for behavior change. If, if it's, um, you know, being, being able to be able to cook, um, being able to, to function in society, are they ready? You know, if they, if they've been incarcerated, do they understand how to go to a restaurant and order something off of a menu? Um, if they don't, maybe you need to be able to walk them through that process or, or they don't understand about going downtown and being able to get a bus pass or, getting some of the things they need. So we have to determine their readiness and then make sure that our interventions are there to address those issues. We have to integrate cultural factors into treatment planning. Um, so that means do not give someone who, um, give someone a menu for food items that they would never eat. I mean, the worst thing you can do is try to introduce people to food that is foreign to them. They're not going to comply. Um, you know, I remember, so I have thyroid problems and I, um, I actually have thyroid cancer for, for those who don't know. And, um, I remember going to, um, the nutritionist because, um, the doctor just refused to believe that something was going on with my thyroid because my thyroid was registering fine, even though it's diseased. And they sent me to the nutritionist and I was sitting there in the office waiting for the nutritionist to come. He walked in, he took one look at me and the first thing he did was, he turned around to his laptop, to his computer, and he just started typing. And then he like spluttered out something like, well, you know, if you stop drinking pop, you can actually lose some weight. And I'm looking at him like, are you serious? Lose weight? Like, did, did, is there somewhere that says that I'm having like an addiction to pop, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, RC? And he started naming off all these sodas. And I'm like, dude, like, I don't even drink pop. <laughs> like, I'm a water person, so I don't drink any sodas or sugary um, drinks or anything like that. And um, in the menu that you gave me, I don't eat any of these things. I don't eat pork. I don't eat beef. I don't eat fish. You know, I'm very, I have a very sensitive palate, so there's lots of things that I can't eat. And he says, um, well, they have you here because you need to lose weight. And I said, well, did they tell you that I have thyroid disease? And, you know, he just looked, and I said, I'm going to report you to your superiors. Um, and then we have to encourage patients to be advocates for themselves throughout their treatment. We've seen far too many people who had COVID who have gone into doctor's offices complaining that they could not breathe, that they were having problems with diarrhea or other issues and going home and dying. Um, there was an African-American woman who was a teacher who went to the doctor four times, four times and was turned away. And then she died. The fifth time she went, they admitted her, um, but she was too far gone. We had a couple here that I know here in Cleveland where they went to the doctor and the doctor told them both that they had the flu, the husband and the wife. The, the wife died the next day and the, the husband died the following day after her. Um, and so we have, um, we have to encourage patients to be um, their best advocates. They, they're a better advocate than I could ever be. Um, and what will work? Medicare for all. Um, unbiased care, care that's available um, in the community, recruiting more minority health professionals, and understanding that racism is the deadliest disease of all. There is a, a video that I was going to show you, but I think I'm out of time. Um, and um, the video is the deadliest disease of all, and the deadliest disease of all is racism. I am Ivanka Hall. I am the executive director of the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. Um, the first coalition in the state of Ohio to focus exclusively on African-American disparities in education, employment, housing, and health. Um, I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, well, Ivanka, thank you. very much for that. What a wonderful presentation. And we're going to go move to question and answers. So, NJ, we'll start with you from the from raised hands. Sounds good. It looks like the first person that we have up is Nancy Larson. Um, let me unmute you here. Nancy? Yes. Go right ahead. You should be unmuted, hopefully. Um, I'm a social worker too, Yvonne, so um, all of this is like right in my wheelhouse. But my question was, could you comment on the legislators voting that, um, well, the Republicans, that racism is not a public health issue at this point? 
Okay, so first off, we have to go back to um, what um, Representative Hoffman said about African Americans. And so that kind of gets us to, to the problem that we're dealing with. So he basically said that, you know, COVID disproportionately impacts African American, the colored people. So colored, which is a word we have not used in a long, long time, except for when we're talking about racism um, or being racist, um, that colored people don't wash their hands. And so when we're talking about a representative who is an emergency room physician, um, that this is the language that he's using as an emergency room physician, who's also a legislator, what is the care component that he's providing to patients who are coming in the emergency room? So we know that his, it cannot be unbiased because everything that come, came out of his mouth was biased. And so he cannot be providing culturally sensitive, unbiased care when he is being culturally insensitive, insensitive and racially biased. Um, and so our legislator is very much, um, um, very much biased in a lot of their um, policies and procedures that happen in Columbus. And I mean, and they're not just biased against African Americans, but we're talking about things that happen within their own po policy. Remember that they, they fought with Amy Acton about protecting their lives um, and with our governor about face masks. So we're talking about folks who are like, I've, I've sat and watched, you know, um, as they stream their meetings um, on um, Ideal Stream. And I've watched their meetings and just been like, cannot believe the things that are coming out of their mouths. So we have um, a legislator that needs to be changed. Um, but the thing is, people have to vote. Voting is very much so important. Like the, your vote is your voice. And we have to get people who are disadvantaged, um, who are more likely to be impacted by systems to um, change their thinking. Because I think what goes on now is people are looking at this and saying, Hey, you know, I've been voting Democrat my whole life and my conditions have never changed. My community is worse than it's ever been. So why should I, I why should I vote? You know, why is voting important? And, and it's like, no, it's not just voting, but it's voting and then raising some hell after you vote. So it doesn't mean that, you're, that you just stick with, I'm voting and I'm done. You're like, no, the day after you vote, you need to start saying, look, these are the, this is the policies, or even before you vote, this is the policy platform that I want for my community. And that either you're going to do this or next time you're out. Like we should not be having people um, as legislators for life. No, nope, we just lost you, the sound. So. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Okay. I want to I want to read something to you for the sake of those that are on the phone or haven't found the chat. And it's from Dan Skinner from Ohio University, who teaches in their medical school. Ivanka wrote a stunning piece on racial disparity in addressing addiction in a book I co-edited on the opioid issue in Ohio. You may want to check it out. All proceeds are donated to the syringe exchange and other harm reduction pro programs. And Dan has um, listed the the link to find that book in the chat. So scroll up in the chat and see if you can find his comment. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. That would be another part of my life, Debbie. So yeah. I, I, am, I am the first African-American woman in the state of Ohio to run a syringe exchange program, a needle wow. exchange reduction program. So um, um, I ran that program before my son was born. So that would have been 24, 25 years ago. And I'm oh also God. an HIV researcher. So I started off as an HIV researcher 26 years ago. Uh -huh. Well, what haven't you done? Look, I try to do it all. I want to make sure that my wheelhouse is completely used when I leave here. <laughs> well, I, you are well on the way. Bill Davis, do we have a question from the chat? Uh, yeah, I saw one question. Um, Bob Crazen was going to ask, would you include gun ownership and the source of the Second Amendment as a form of racism? So I think that it, it's not so much gun ownership. I think it's the NRA and how the NRA operates. Um, because when we talk about things that disproportionately impact African Americans when it involves a gun, the NRA won't speak up about, like police brutality, they won't speak up about, about it, or they won't speak up about, about anything around African Americans. But the minute someone challenges um, white America around anything around guns, all of a sudden the NRA is like, you know, a whole different, like, oh, yeah, we, we have to advocate for. For, for people to be able to have their guns. 
Um, and so I think that if they're going to be an advocacy, advocacy group, then that's what they are. Are you advocacy? Are you political? You know, um, so the NRA spends a lot of money in politics. And so I think that the NRA, um, for a lot of their policies, are a very oppressive group. Well, Thank I you. thought that the NRA was for gun control um, when the Black Panthers, you know, came to light, came into power and stuff. And so they were for gun control then. Um, but then after the Black Panthers were discredited and, and that died down, then they were against it. No, it was just, a, it was a change in leadership at the NRA. So when, they're, when they changed their leadership and a lot, they were like infiltrated, like a lot of these other groups with people that were members of, you know, the Klan. And so, you know, the Klan is not advocating for black people to have guns. Uh-huh. Right. No, no, they're not. So, yeah. Um, NJ, do we have someone from the, with hands up? We do. Next up, we have uh, the wonderful Brad Cotton. Let me unmute you, Dr. Cotton. There you go. Go for it. I'm just a little tense, but uh, hey, Ivanka, I'd rather listen to you than another Ivanka uh, any day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, in the early to mid 80s, I was a, a medic for Cleveland EMS on the East Side Medic 9 and 10 areas, you know, East 79th, East 93rd, Kinsman, Chester, all the. Uh, there he is, and it's just, uh, you know, East 40th and Central, and it's, it's sad that the, the lives that people have to lead uh, that live there. And I remember looking at the Cleveland Clinic and seeing those gleaming towers at night and the Arab sheiks flying on their helicopters and thinking, you know, this healthcare system is not fair. Um, but uh, commenting as, as an emergency physician has practiced for a, a number of years, uh, Medicare for All would solve, a, not all, but at least some of what you talk about about interactions with the healthcare system because it's all driven by money and billing and it's driven by uh, physicians in the office who tell you can't have an appointment if you're 15 minutes late or to make assumptions or are turning to work on their laptop to get the information in there or even in the ER where you're literally just being rushed through all the time because you have administrators telling you you got to generate more profit you got to generate more billing, and the physician has been reduced to a billing machine for the corporate healthcare system. Uh, and it burns physicians out too. They get moral injury because they know they can't do the kind of job they would like to do. So, uh, granted, racism certainly is a huge part of it, but if we can change the economic structure to where every patient is a paying patient, and if you're Medicaid, you don't get treated worse and rush through so that they can get to paying patients and make some money uh, would certainly help fix a, a lot of issues. And I want to thank you for your presentation. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, the Medi Medicare for All would, would definitely change a lot of the dynamics So um, in our healthcare system because it would, um, it would take us down from having all these different payees, payers, um, to a singular, singular, a government payee. Um, and then that would, would change a lot of the dynamics that are in the office, but we still have to, we still have to work on how we treat African Americans. So, um, Medicare for all is not going to change the bias that people have in their own spirits about who they're working with every single day, you know, um, and I think that that's one of the things that's, that's really big. And we also have to make sure that if we're pushing Medicare for all, that we have to make sure that our doctors are still are getting, are able to have a living wage. Um, because I think that that's one of the big concerns too um, with the medical professionals is that they're going to, to you know, all of a sudden be these um, um, making minimum wage doing medical care. Um, and so we want to make sure that our medical professionals have a living wage. <laughs> We lost you again, Ivanka. You, your your sound come you know fades in and out. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We, we want to make sure that our medical um, care has um ha providers have a living wage. Right. Um, Bill, do we have a, another question from the chat? No, I haven't seen any others come in. Well, I've got one here. Um, do you know of any cultural competency training programs for health promotion and healthcare workers in Ohio? Um, yes. yes. So, okay. there, so I'm on the board of that program and it's in Columbus. It's called MAC. It's the Multi-Ethnic Advocates for Cultural Competency. And we do trainings all over the state. Um, okay. It's called MAC, M-A-C-C. -C, um, and um, I actually do trainings for them. So I go out and do trainings um, on behalf of MAC. 
um, around cultural competency. And it depends on what I'm addressing, whether it's um, cancer or whether I'm addressing bias or whatever. Um, and I just recently did one before, before COVID, um, I did one for, um, for lupus. Is it lupus? Mm -hmm. I think it's the Lupus Foundation. Yeah, the Lupus Foundation. So I did one for them. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, and we'll pass that information on to the sponsor of our bill and make sure that there are some provisions there for cultural competency because that is a huge, huge issue I think that we need to address. Um, NJ, in the um, hands up. Next up, we have uh, Stephen Rondor, I think it is. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, that was just a perfect segue, Debbie, um, with the bill. So uh, yeah, my name is Stefan Ramdo. I'm actually a guest from Connecticut uh, with the grassroots group Medicare for All Connecticut. And um, I spoke to Debbie a few days ago, and she uh, told me about this event tonight, which is fantastic. So I wanted to um, ask about also specifically the bill. So uh, for example, with us in Connecticut, we don't have um, a state level bill yet, like the uh, one, the 292, uh, HP 292 that you have in Ohio. So we're working right now with um, state uh, legislators to try to draft a bill. And um, uh, yeah, I, I thought like it was so interesting also in the last slide, um, recruiting more minority healthcare professionals. And then like finally also the uh, cultural competency, competency or the um, proficiency was mentioned. And I, I was wondering like, how can one best incorporate um, some of these things possibly as provisions, uh, provisions into a bill. Um, Debbie, you want me to answer that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, I think it would be the same way, is to, to incorporate those pieces into legislation that would be policy changes, um, and it would be a statewide policy change so that they would know that it's not just something that you're doing just locally, that it's something that's going to take place from the state down. Because I think that a lot of times what happens is that when we do, um, when we do state policy um, and we force locally to, to do it, it works better than trying to do it on a local level because a lot of times locally what they'll do is fight it because they'll say, well, the state didn't, you know, it has no authorization in the state. Like, you know, one of the things they did here in Cleveland was we were doing the fight for 15 and they went to the state and had the state preempt the fight for 15 and just cut them off at the knees. And so we want to make sure that whatever legislation, that if it's coming from the state, that the cities, local and county, have to follow it. And, and I think, you know, to add to that, if we have a statewide bill that enacts a public, um, you know, a, 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 as close to we can get single payer program here in Ohio, and that is statewide, and that takes precedence over the entire state, and makes those requirements. And if and we need to be requiring the cult, um, cultural competency as part of the, um, training, not just for physicians, but for nurses and everyone in that healthcare field, you know, because everyone has that effect on the patient. It's, um, you know, not just the doctor. So we need to, to educate all of them. That has to become part of their education. And process. I think one of the things is important for everybody to know is that when, when people curl, with my beautician who does my hair has to do cultural competency training. So how is it that my beautician who has to do, who curls my hair has to have cultural competency training, but my police and doctors don't. So, I, you, know, the, you know, you have to, <laughs> to look at these systems and say, okay, well, how much cultural competency do you need in order for you to curl my hair? <laughs> Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, we're going to go to the chat now. We have one from Levon Seiler who says, Ivanka, what would be the best way to reach out to the Black community to support single-payer health care? I think the best way is to, to, to start outlining the benefits, letting people know what the benefits are to them, because I think that what has happened is we get it from, from the other side so much as they're like, oh, you're going to lose everything. And it's like, well, we don't have anything to lose. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so if you have communities that are disproportionately, that are disproportionately unemployed, they don't have an employer-sponsored health care. So for them, it is the, this is the best 
I see the interruption. For for them who for people who don't have employer sponsored health or have. Well, adding on to that, um, how do we build trust with the black community to be able to reach out? So. Um, so one of the things I talk about when I talk about trust um, um, is that trust takes time. You know, trust cannot be built with anybody overnight, it, particularly when you have a community that has been so hurt by putting trust into people and into systems only to find out that in the end they lost. Um, and so trust takes time. So that means be willing to fight with the community. Um, about all of the issues that impact the community and not just say, you know, I'm only focusing on this singular thing, but whether it's around Black Lives Matter, whether it's around education, whether it's around housing and the, and the impact of lead poisoning, you know, in the, in the African American community, like be willing and ready to fight. Like for me, I'm on the battleground for all the fights. Like, you know, if you see a fight, Ivanka is in the fight because for one, my, my community trusts me. And so, and they know that if I'm out there fighting, they're willing to stand with me to fight. Thank you. Okay, okay. NJ, do we have um, hands up? We do. The next up is uh, Michael Dover. Oh, I guess I'm already unmuted. Yep. Thank you, Ivanka. It's good to see you. Uh, I guess um, my question is a, is a dual one, and it comes out of the debate I'm involved in right now because we're fighting within our profession of social work to have a national. Uh, a, a national summit on fighting racism, and two poles of debates have arisen. Uh, the, what's called the either or, or approach, which wants to support the Black Lives Matter movement and its policy demands, and another that's the, called the both and, that's sort of like is sort of hedging their bets and talking about various reforms like community policing and stuff like that. Well, we have that same sort of poll here within the, those people who want to fight for a single payer system and have been for many years and those who are fighting for uh, for a uh, uh, you know for the uh, uh, for the public option and, and then there's some people who would like to see you know uh, you know real med the current Medicare system given to everyone which of course involves private insurance companies paying the claims in all these dist districts and you know the right to Medicare for all universally, so there's really three positions there. Uh, I guess the question I have to you and maybe anybody else that wants to ch uh, jump in is, we have a real a window of opportunity here to make major structural changes in this society. And if you look back, and I teach history of, the, of social work and social work, if you look back in the 30s, there was a Lundgren bill that the left you know, fought like the Dickens for against social security. And luckily they lost. Uh, so the question is going to be, what what are we advocates going to do, uh, you know, when it, if there's a, a, a Biden election and these bills start running through the first hundred days of the Senate in the effort to get them there, what are what, what is the single payer action network going to do, and what are, are what are we going to do? <laughs> so um, so Michael Dover. Um, so I think that one of the things that we do understand about racism um, and the impact of racism, in particular when we're talking around, around Medicare for All, is that, um, as I said before, African Americans are less likely to have um, an employer-sponsored health care. Um, and so that means that white America is more likely to have an employer-sponsored health care. So um, we have to make sure that... Um, that white America is on board to making sure that there's parity for all America. And so, um, and that may be a little uncomfortable for white America, but I think that black people have been uncomfortable for a very long time. Um, and that, you know, white America has to have some uncomfort um, in order for us to get some parity for all. Um, and I think that that's, you know, one of the things that happened with this whole with COVID, you know, is that, you know, we were we were on, well on the way to really, you know, discussing COVID openly until we started talking about Black people. When they started talking about African Americans were more likely to be impacted by COVID, all of a sudden, nationally, we were like, yeah, I'm done. Don't want to talk about it anymore. I mean, from Washington, it was just like silence. Like, oh, Black people are more impacted? Oh, yeah, well, we're not, we don't have to have any more news conferences. We don't have to have anything else. 
And so what we need to do is we have to understand that in order for us to actually level this playing field, that, that we're going to, our comfort level is going to have to change. And it's not only just a little bit, you know, it's just going to have to change for a little bit in order for us all to have what we rightfully should have had in the first place, which is the ability for us to live out our lives um, with health and wellness for everybody. Yeah, I think part of this question also went to what is the single payer action network going to do? And I'm going to tell you that um, Joe Biden can get elected and he can come in and ask for his, for the public option. Um, and we are still going to promote single payer health care. We are still going to promote um, Pramila J. Appel's bill and Bernie Sanders bill because you don't go in and ask for what you're willing to settle for. We have to hold that higher ideal. And there aren't going to be that many groups that are going to do that. You're going to, and we're going to be facing a lot of opposition. But if we really push for that higher ideal and for what we really need, the chances of getting a better program out of it, you know, improve, you know, in that type of thing. Um, I did a lot of contract negotiations. If I was willing to settle for a 3% raise, I didn't go in and ask for 3%. I asked for 6 Aim high. Yeah. You know, and sometimes I got more than the 3%. You know, so there was one time we got three years of 5% and that type of thing. But I wouldn't have gotten that if I had asked for 3 You know, when I was, well, there was only one time when I went in, we went in and we said that we'd take the 3 And we said, we'll take your 3% for three years. You leave our health care alone. And they came back and said, well, we need to talk about health care. We said, nah, we'll see you with the full package. See, bye. And that type of thing. And, uh, you know, when you're negotiating, and that's what these deliberations are in Congress, they're negotiations. You don't negotiate from the middle. You negotiate from the top. That was the mistake that was made with the ACA. It would have been a stronger bill if there had been a public option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And the public option has to be done correctly. You can do a public option and set it up for failure. You can do a public option and set it up to lead into a single payer plan and that, but it has to be done correctly and yeah. that. And so, and I don't trust them to do it correctly. So we're going to have to stay on it and be pushing for total inclusion, everyone in the whole nine yards, the whole way. So definitely. Yep. All right. Bill, do we have anyone else, uh, other questions in the chat? Yes. Um, Linda Brown asked, which food assistance options meet the cultural needs of communities better, SNAP or food pantries? Well, um, so African Americans are less likely to be on um, welfare assistance um, than white Americans. So, um, you know, so for when we're talking about our, these SNAP programs um, and food pantries, um, food pantries, um, mainly rely on people to be able to have transportation in order for them to get to them. But SNAP allows you to be able to go to the store and get the things that you need. Um, and so I think that there's, um, you know, th there's a catch 22 in it. Um, like, um, like we, we, we just had a call yesterday with some of my colleagues and we were talking about some of the things that are being offered in these food um, pantries um, where they're getting like produce that's supposed to be fresh. Um, and then going through the boxes and finding out that half the produce is rotten. And now you have to give, go through the boxes to give out stuff to the community. And you're trying to give them what you can find um, within those, the, the things that have been given to you. Um, and so that can be hard. And so the, the, the one of my colleagues that was on the call said, you know, I had to go through cases and cases of greens in order to find um, some batches that I could actually save. And, um, and she said, I couldn't believe that they brought so much stuff that was there that was, that needed, that was about to be wasted. And she said, I, you know, I couldn't understand why they couldn't get it earlier before it was all rotted. And she even talked about like the cucumbers and tomatoes and the things that they had that were part of um, this food pantry. And so I, I think that food pantries are important. And as we know, um, you know, um, Linda, um, I don't know if you know, but a lot of our colleges, um, particularly our HBCUs, our historically black colleges, have um, food pantries in them for the students because so many of the students were going hungry um, because they do not qualify for the food programs 
at school that they had to open up pantries in these universities in order for the students to have something to eat. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, we, we have to revision um, these programs um, and how they meet the needs of the community. And maybe it's a combination of both is to, to, to have the, the food pantry and the, um, I think they've tried it, you know, before where um, they tried to do um, these food coupons that were to be used at farmer's markets. But we don't have a lot of farmer's markets. Um, as a matter of fact, we don't have any farmer's markets in the inner city. Um, and so being able to be able to use those at um, farmer's markets for um, inner city residents uh, was like, it was like a, um, you know, like, hold on, let's, let's see, this hide and seek. Let's see if we can find a farmer's market. So, um, but thank you for that question. I hope that I answered it. Thank you, Ivanka. Matt, NJ, um, hands up. Yep. Uh, next up, we have Michael Maloney. Unmute you. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, Ivanka, for your call to action tonight. And I'm a white psychiatrist trying to work with my colleagues to try to figure out what to do. The Black Lives Matter has been a wake-up call, I think, for many of us. I went in with a couple of the protests here in Cincinnati and came up with talk, listening to the young people involved in these marches. And they walk very fast, by the way. It's very interesting. <laughs> Um, but if you're not a race anti-racist, then you're a racist. If you're not an anti-racist, you're a racist. That was a wake-up call to me. That's it's. Uh, I was going to say black or white. I guess you could say, use that too. Uh, and then racism really is a white problem. Ca cause it's caused by white people, and we're the ones that need to act. The burden is on us. I found that a very good insight to from the young people talking. And yeah. I wondered what you thought about those comments. Um, Dr. Maloney, that actually, um, the whole thing around um, racism and um, defining that racism was a, um, and that our ghettos and things are things that are ran and um, supported by, by whites, um, actually came out of the Kerner Commission report in 1968. And so the Kerner Commission report spoke very eloquently about um, white supremacy in these systems and how the systems are ran and how they're basically ran in order for them to keep African-Americans disadvantaged. And so we have to look at these systems and say, how do we change policies to be able to impact the lives and change the lives and conditions of folks um, who live in our community, who live, work, play, and pray um, in our communities. And, um, and you're in Cincinnati and I've done, um, a number of things in Cincinnati. I know I recorded a, um, a commercial on one of your jazz stations about heart disease a few years ago. But, um, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, we have to have, um, in order for this to work now, like this is our national call. Um, George Floyd was our wake up call for white and black America to know that we have to work together, that we cannot work in a silo, that this will take white and black America to change the conditions that are going on in the African-American community. The African-American community's voice is not a voice that can stand alone. We have to have our white partners and progressive partners who are willing to say, I'm willing to fight and stand with you. Um, that's why the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Act worked because white and black folks stood together, stood on those front lines, took those beatings, um, died and fought in order for us to be able to change the conditions that were going on in the African-American community. Thank you. Bill Davis, any more from the chat? Um, I have one that um, might not be specific for Ivanka, but um, anyway, it says, in Ohio, adults with disabilities who enter the Medicare program no longer have the option of purchasing a supplemental policy to cover expenses not covered by original Medicare. How will Medicare for all address that type of disparity? Well, first of all, I'm confused on that one because Medicare is a national program. How can, I don't think Ohio can set rules for national programs, can they? Um, Alice, can, Alice Farina, I'm trying to unmute her. 
And I thought somebody answered it too in the chat. Well, it was answered in the chat. Um, it may not have been answered correctly in the chat. You know, my brother is disabled and on Medicare and he has a supplemental plan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that, that um, it can be done and I don't think an Ohio can prevent you from buying a supplemental plan if you have the money. Okay, here's our uh, former director of Medicare. Yeah, you were asking about what states can do about Medicare. Um, states can only have a say in Medicaid mm -hmm. because it's a partnership between the states and the federal government. Now, they can't override uh, federal regulations, but they, they have some say in um, some of the criteria and some of the coverage. Uh, I don't see how they could have anything to say about m Medicare. Yeah, and and, and that was and, pe and people often do misspeak when they are talking about Medicare and Medicaid. They'll say the wrong word. Um, um, yeah, it, it, with Medicaid, that might be the thing, but Medicaid is tends to cover more. Um, Linda has her hand up, and maybe she can. Yeah, Linda, that was Linda's question. Um, Super. I can you hear me. Yeah. Yeah. It is within the state. The insurance, the Department of Insurance, can authorize the companies that actually sell supplemental plans, and the state system has authorized insurance companies to be allowed to sell those supplemental plans. However, the insurance companies are not required to and have chosen and decided that it's too cost prohibitive. So I didn't know if people were aware if well, you were disabled and under the age of 65. Now, if you reach age 65 and you're in the system, then you can buy a supplemental plan, but that's an age-based option. Well, uh, supplemental, supplemental plans are separate from Medicare. Correct. Medicare program does not sell supplemental. Supplemental plans are offered by like AARP, um, your, uh, in retirement, uh, your previous but is employer. It a is it a discrimination to not offer people with disabilities a supplemental option? Well, that, that's a totally different question. Uh, because it's a private, Supplemental plans are, in some sense, private plans. Uh, many are offered through your retirement benefits program, and, and many of those are opting out. Uh, but I, I don't know how to answer your question about discrimination. <laughs> Um, well, actually, the answer has helped me realize that the Advantage plan option, which is the only option for adults under age 65 in the Medicare system, you've helped me understand that the Advantage plan system, as we chant for Medicare for all, and they impose an Advantage plan system, it, it might be better than the original Medicare. As we entered that circumstance, I thought original Medicare was going to be a better option, but... Um, I, have chosen, I have chosen original Medicare. Some people have found that the Advantage plans are an advantage to them. Unfortunately, they also have disadvantages to them. Right. Uh, so the Advantage plans are... Um, are quite different from traditional Medicare and they're financed differently. And I right. think we need to make a point here. Medicare for all, you know, the bills that are Medicare for all have nothing to do with this because when you've got Medicare, when you're talking Medicare for all, it's really expanded and improved. There's no need for a supplemental plan for That's Medicare correct. for all. That's and correct. It is, it is totally comprehensive and totally inclusive. It, it, it goes to everybody. It includes medical, dental, vision, hearing, all, and, and mental health care. It also has no deductibles, no co-pays, no co-insurance. That's what the Medicare for All plans are. Okay. Yeah, so it's Thank not medical, it's not Medicare that. advantage. I don't want to detract from Ivanka's wonderful presentation, get back yep. on the topic of racism and health care. Your presentation has been incredibly enlightening. 
I, my only wish is more people had seen it. We're going to guide them to the website because you're going to post this, right? You're going to post this oh, yeah. presentation she just made so we can get more people informed. Yes. We, just, just delete as, the just, question I just asked about. <laughs> yeah. Just as, as we posted all the others, we will be also be posting this one as okay. well. Thank so, you. So, okay. Do we have any other hands up? I don't see nope. any. I think, I think that that is it. And any other questions in the chat? Well, if that's the case, we want to say thank you to Ivanka for a wonderful presentation and some spirited discussion that here. And um, so I'm going to unmute everybody and let's give Ivanka a big cheer and Yay. Hey, Ivanka. Thank you. Uh, Yay. Thanks so much. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't get everyone unmuted. What happened? No. Oh. It says everybody's unmuted. Yeah. yeah. They have to accept no. it. They have to accept being unmuted. Good to see you. Oh, okay. So they're not letting me be the host. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's it. Um, and that. So thank you all for joining us. And we will be back. Uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus. And then we're going to be back with more programs along this line. And we'll hope you'll all come back and join us for those. <laughs>